well, thank you guys for being here today. We have this great opportunity to pick Dr. Ellie LaRoque's brain here. She, um, really thrilled to have her on, on board. I was thinking when I met you uh, last, and it was more than 10 years ago, because it was before I was even pregnant with Inaya, who's now 10. So um, it goes by really, really fast. <laughs> so she's a fabulous orthopedic surgeon and fabulous person beyond that. So I'm just going to turn it over to her. I've asked her to share some information about shoulders. I find shoulders to be something that we do see a lot of uh, people coming in with shoulder pain uh, into physical therapy, into Pilates, into movement. And uh, a lot of times they want us to solve their shoulder problem. And sometimes it's worth knowing a little bit more about when they need to see somebody else or not. Um, and so I asked Ellie to talk about shoulders a bit and she's gonna leave us some good time for questions as well. So I will let you take it away. All right, good. So yeah, my, my name is Ellie LaRoque and as, as Zaina said, I've, I've worked with her for years. Um, yeah, I've been in practice about, about 14 years now. Um, and where I practice now is in San Francisco in the Mission Bay neighborhood and then also in Redwood Shores. Um, I work with UCSF full time and they, they have a new clinic that opened in, in Redwood Shores on the peninsula in December. So that's been, been really exciting. There are actually um, 10, 10 orthopedists down there. So, um, so we're able to provide a lot of good care on the peninsula. Um, and then my background is in knee and shoulder. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon, so some of my patients end up having surgery, but a lot of my patients don't. A lot of times I'm able to help get them better with people like you, <laughs> with physical therapy or even a cortisone injection, um, things like that. So I, I see a lot of patients also who, who do not need, need surgery. Um, so I just picked a couple of common, um, common things that we see in clinic and that I'm sure that, that you see about the shoulder. And feel free to interrupt too, or put something in the chat as I go along, but I will, yeah, leave time for a Q&A at the end. Okay, so the, these are the uh, topics I'm gonna cover today, um, rotator cuff disease and frozen shoulder, and also have a little discussion about injections such as cortisone, PRP, and stem cells, because we're getting more and more questions about those from patients. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually gonna start with a uh, frozen shoulder. And uh, we also call that adhesive capsulitis. And it's really caused by moderate to severe inflammation in the joint lining. And then the joint lining thickens and it creates pain and stiffness. So it basically makes the joint just close in on itself and then you get reduced range of motion. But the root of it is inflammatory. Um, and often you can diagnose frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis um, definitely without an MRI and sometimes even, even without an X-ray. Um, so the onset is usually sudden, sudden onset, onset of stiffness and pain, whereas say shoulder arthritis that can also cause stiffness, usually that has more of a gradual onset throughout the years. Uh, women get frozen shoulder more often than men. Usually there's no trauma. People can just wake up with it. The pain can be very severe. It's about five times more common in people with diabetes than without diabetes. And the most common age group uh, for people to get frozen shoulder is about 40 to 60. Um, so if I have a new patient in clinic that I'm suspicious of maybe frozen shoulder, I would at least just get a plain X-ray, not an MRI, but just a plain X-ray. Because if they have a lot of stiffness in all planes, say active and passive, uh, then they probably either have frozen shoulder or arthritis. And if you just get a basic x-ray, then uh, you can see if they have arthritis or not. So for example, um, this x-ray on the left, you see some joint space in the glenohumeral joint right here. And then on the right, you see basically bone on bone arthritis. Okay, and um, adhesive capsulitis is really a, a clinical diagnosis, so you don't need an MRI. This is one of the few shoulder um, ailments where you, you really don't need an MRI. Associated rotator cuff tears with frozen shoulder are very rare. Some studies show like less than even 1%. Um, and then if somebody does have newly diagnosed frozen shoulder, um, it is good to make sure that they are just in regular communication with their primary care physician because they might have occult diabetes, you know, have diabetes and not know it, and that might be a risk factor, or also thyroid issues and not, not know it, and that could also be a risk factor. 
Okay, so some things you could check, um, just start with range of motion. So check their active range of motion. If that's decreased, then check passive range of motion. And if that's decreased, then you could have them see us. We would at least consider an x-ray. And if the x-ray show is abnormal showing glenohumeral narrowing, then they'd be diagnosed with glenohumeral joint arthritis and not frozen shoulder. But if the x-ray is normal, then they would be diagnosed with, uh, with frozen shoulder. And there are three stages of adhesive capsulitis. The first is freezing. That's usually the first three to nine months. Those patients have a lot of pain, um, some loss of range of motion, and they have pain at rest and pain with sleeping too, can be very severe. Uh, then it goes into this frozen phase, usually months four to 12, where they don't have as much pain, it's stable, but they have still severe decreased range of motion. And then they eventually get to thawing, usually um, anywhere from about 12 to, um, actually it should be 24, <laughs> 24 months, uh, where they, they tend to then get gradual increase in, in range of motion, but the average time to resolution, uh, especially if we don't do anything for it, is anywhere from one to three years. So it can be very frustrating. Um, so what do we do to treat frozen shoulder? You can optimize diabetic control. Okay, that, that does help. Um, we also try to help the patients with the pain. So they can take oral anti-inflammatories or um, have injected cortisone. And why I said two is uh, you can actually do an injection in the glenohumeral joint. That would need to be done with ultrasound guidance with a few of my partner, which a few of my partners do. Um, and then you can also do a cortisone injection more for the tendonitis component of frozen shoulder. And that would be up higher in the subacromial space. Um, and physical therapy and Pilates, we, especially physical therapy, but we do often order that to help uh, restore range of motion and help them strengthen in ways that, that doesn't flare up the shoulder. You also could consider acupuncture. I've done a literature search on this and some studies do show that acupuncture might, might help with frozen shoulder because maybe it affects you know, inflammation and pain and blood flow. And then you can also consider capsular distension injections but those can be really painful and they often help just temporarily. So those usually are not my injections of choice. And this is just an example of looking in somebody's shoulder that has frozen shoulders. So for example, on the right, here's the, um, the humeral head. This is the subscapularis tendon in the front. All of this is joint lining. This is all undersurface of rotator cuff on the left and it just looks bright red and angry. Um, but it is really rare that we would ever do surgery for it. But for refractory cases, we sometimes do manipulation under anesthesia and or um, an arthroscopy surgery to actually clean out all of this inflamed joint lining. And uh, we can systematically arthroscopically um, use a cautery device to make little rents in the tight capsule to try to improve the range of motion. Okay, so we get a lot of question about, um, oh, go, go, go ahead. Did somebody have a, a question? Okay, so I'll just keep going. Yeah, so we, we do get questions about um, corticosteroids, uh, steroids, cortisone, sometimes it, it gets a bad rap, but how I explain it to patients is really all it is is a targeted anti-inflammatory. It's like throwing a bucket of water on the fire. It's like injecting liquefied Advil in there. So it probably inhibits um, things like COX-2 and phospholipase A2, which are both inflammatory mediators. And we usually mix it with the local anesthetic for the injection. And it can take effect quickly or over maybe two to three weeks. And depending on the condition, it might help short-term or long-term. And I always warn people about the potential side effects would be flushing or jitteriness. About 10% of people will get that for maybe a day and also elevated blood sugars if somebody already has known diabetes. Okay, so um, example for case number one here, this is a 50 year old right hand dominant woman with type two diabetes presents with three months of severe left shoulder pain, no injury. She's waking up at night due to pain Her shoulder feels very stiff. She's having trouble reaching behind and raising her arm overhead. On exam, she has no muscle atrophy, no point tenderness. There is decreased active and passive motion of the left shoulder in all planes. Her rotator cuff strength though is normal, but it is difficult for her to perform some of her strength testing due to limited range of motion and pain. And we have a shoulder x-ray for her and it's normal. Okay, so for this patient, say on the left, 
yes, this limited active and passive external rotation is a key finding, and that's pretty pretty fast to um, to check on on exam. Okay, so how would we treat this patient? Um, provide a, a shoulder sling to use for comfort. No, I would worry actually that she would get more stiff. Uh, recommend shoulder injection. We'll talk about that. Recommend physical therapy. Um, we will talk about that and obtain a shoulder MRI. I would say no, because it sounds like frozen shoulder. And then I wouldn't rush to get an MRI and I wouldn't refer for mm -hmm. arthroscopy because she hasn't really tried conservative treatment. So with this patient, I would actually at least talk to her about a glenohumeral shoulder steroid injection, okay? Because it just seems like her symptoms are so severe in terms of pain that she might not be able to participate in physical therapy that well unless she had a cortisone first. So I would say, see, you know, we, you could recommend physical therapy. She's welcome to try it first, but this is actually somebody where we feel like it's not too aggressive to do a shoulder cortisone injection first right away. So again, here's some keys from her history. Um, she has a known history of diabetes. She's had severe shoulder pain for three months. That's why I would think about an injection. She's very stiff. She has decreased active and passive range of motion, but good rotator cuff strength and her x-ray is normal. Okay, so maybe any questions about frozen shoulder before I move on to say um, impingement and rotator cuff disease? Yes. I have a question for you. <laughs> I'm going to jump right in myself. So we, I have a few clients actually who have frozen shoulder. I didn't get to see them. I get, I sometimes get people kind of after, after, after the fact, and this is one of them. Um, and she never really rehabilitated her shoulders very well. And she still has super limited range of motion. This is probably three years post hmm. bilateral frozen shoulder. And so I'm wondering if you think, I mean, I, I feel like there's work that could be still done for her at this to try and restore some range of motion. Um, is there a change in the integrity of the capsule or the joint that would prevent that you think after so long of being present and not regaining full range of motion? Or would you say that you think it could be, her motion could be restored at least partially? Yeah, I mean, three years, that that's, that's on the longer side for sure. I mean, I'd say yeah. one to two years for resolution of the stiffness and, and some of the pain is, is pretty average, but three years is, is, is very long. So a few things then with that patient, I'd probably be a little more aggressive, not, not necessarily with physical therapy or Pilates, but just with, with treatment and workup. So I don't know if they've say seen a, you know, an MD type specialist where, where they've say had oral anti-inflammatories and at least one or two cortisone injections. Um, I would consider that for sure at this point. And then probably having them check in with their primary doctor just to make sure that they're not missing an underlying, mm -hmm. say, yeah, thyroid or diabetes problem where the body biologically is not able to, to resolve the frozen shoulder as quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then also just make sure the patient's had an x-ray, right? To make sure that it is, it is frozen shoulder, it's not arthritis, because if it's arthritis, then mm -hmm it might not resolve at all over three years or it might even get worse. Um, but if they've tried some of those things and they're still that symptomatic and, and you're just, you've hit a wall with range of motion with therapy, then that is somebody I would wanna see and you know look at the x-rays, potentially get an MRI just to make sure nothing's being missed. Like maybe there's a, a rare mm -hmm. rotator cuff tear on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then I, I would talk to them at that point after three years about surgery. And usually it's a, it's a combination of a controlled manipulation with the arthroscopic, we call it lysis of adhesion, just very systematic release. So we know we're not ripping the rotator cuff and uh, we're getting the range of motion back in the planes that are important. Um, and then mm -hmm. making sure though, say coordinating with you for aftercare, making sure that they can get in right away yeah. after and that their pain control is good after so that they can maintain the motion. Um, so yeah, that, that might be somebody who would actually need a procedure and I don't know where they are, but you know, I would be happy to see them or, um, or I'm sure just a local, a, a local yeah. good shoulder orthopedist would be a good fit. Yeah. She's, she is actually in the Bay Area. She does have Hashimoto's mm -hmm. um, and she, but she's not in really any pain. So she doesn't really, um, she, 
I don't know. She doesn't feel that limited. She just has no motion. I mean, it's, wow. I, I, I look at her and I go, don't you want to do something about that? And she's <laughs> like, I'm not in pain, like, but you can only lift up your arms like this, like, you know? Um, so yeah, it's it just an interesting case to me because I, usually I would think she would have some discomfort also associated, but um, she doesn't. So uh, it's hard to put someone who's not in pain, who's not very motivated right. to, but I know what that's going to look like 10 years from now. I mean, she's only 50 now. So 10 years from now, there's going to be so much compensation in the neck and shoulder region that something else is going to bother her thoracic or cervical or so. It, exactly. Yeah. 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 No, I get it. If she doesn't have pain and, and probably that Hashimoto's is a risk factor for that capsule, just taking longer to thaw. Um, but, but I would say for the shoulder, if it's just stable, just flat line motion, but she can live with it and no pain, I think it's actually safe to just leave that shoulder for years with respect to the shoulder. Okay. But, but I understand yeah. your concern. I mean, the problem is then her other shoulder might get inflamed or, you know, her neck might hurt. She might start getting a lot of muscle spasms around the area. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to see her or even just for a video visit to talk, talk it through with her. Um, but yeah, you know me, Zane, I'm so conservative with surgery. And especially I know, I know. It's just to operate on somebody who's pretty pain-free. Um, yeah. But may, may, maybe she could have a cortisone shot in the joint just to even not, not for pain, but maybe just to help with some of the, mm -hmm. the, the thickened inflammation in there. It might help kind of soften the joint lining. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I could okay. get that yeah. set up or, you know, Kristen and Marin, right, is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, okay, let me see here. Oh, here we go. So I'm on, I'm on rotator cuff now. All right, here we go. Okay, so, so now I just want to talk a little bit about rotator cuff because um, issues with the rotator cuff are just so common, um, as well as just shoulder pain in the general population prevalence is about 14 to 34%. And then of patients with shoulder pain, rotator cuff disease uh, is the cause in about 65%. So definitely more common than, than frozen shoulder. Okay, so, um, so what is the rotator cuff? Uh, we actually know what that is with this group, um, but here's just a couple of pictures. And then you can have all different types of tears, full tears, partial tears. Um, these tears can be acute traumatic or more chronic degenerative. And um, if the patient's symptomatic from these tears, then usually they have pain at night and weakness with overhead activity, like activities with say the elbow arm away from the body. And um, just something else good to know that full thickness tears do not heal. So that's why we are more, much more aggressive with those with surgery compared to say partial tears. They will heal with surgery most of the time, but without surgery, the tendon is detached. It doesn't have a good blood, blood supply and it will not suddenly heal back to the bone on its own. So here's an example of a full thickness tear in the supraspinatus. This is looking down at it. So this would be like a crescent or a U-shaped tear. This is the exposed footprint of bone down there. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, impingement, bursitis, tendonitis. I categorize those together for patients just for simplicity. And then partial thickness tearing and full thickness tearing. Okay, so um, partial thickness tear just means that the tendon is not torn all the way through. So if you picture the rotator cuff tendons being like a thick rope, it's just frayed through partially. Uh, and then a full thickness tear is where the tendon is completely disrupted. It's usually torn directly off the bone. So this would be an example of some bursitis associated say with impingement where you look in the subacromial space arthroscopically and it looks red or pink. There's inflammation and hypervascularity in there. This is an example of, a, ro of a, a rotator cuff partial tear where it's just partly torn through with some fraying. And then this would be a full tear where you're looking into the hole. Um, this would say be the supraspinatus and that's actually looking into the glenoid and the labrum, okay? And the bare footprint here on the top of the humeral head. So impingement, vers impingement bursitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, uh, why do you why, why does physical therapy and why do Pilates help? Well, and I always, do, I always explain this to patients because when I order this, I want them to really be motivated to participate and believe that it will help their symptoms, which I think it does. So, um, so one common cause we believe of 
bursitis and tendonitis where the bursts on the rotator cuff area here are inflamed is if say somebody has a low lying acromion or type two to three acromion where they just have reduced subacromial space. So especially with any overhead activity or twisting, there's more rubbing pressure on the rotator cuff. Um, but I always explain to the patients that this acromion is actually part of your shoulder blade. So through say scapular stabilization exercises, trying to get the scapula more retracted, you can actually bring the acromion up and give them mechanically more clearance. Plus, if you think about the trajectories of say the, um, the subscap and the, the, the teres in the back, they actually have a, a trajectory with the muscle kind of like this, kind of at a diagonal. So if you really strengthen those muscle groups, oh, sorry, it would be more like this. <laughs> they attach to the humeral head. Then it actually helps bring the ball down. So that would be internal external rotation exercises can also give you more clearance for the rotator cuff and the bursa. So for impingement tendonitis bursitis, I always start conservative, physical therapy, maybe an injection and medication. But if somebody has a traumatic or symptomatic full thickness tear, like say they're referred to you and you have the MRI report and yeah, they had a trauma and they, they have a full thickness tear, I, I really think those patients should be referred because they just probably won't get better with conservative treatment. And there's a little bit time is of the essence there too, because you don't want the tear to progress. But if you say have a new patient who just has a symptomatic partial tear, whether it was traumatic or atraumatic, I would say for those patients, you can try conservative treatment first, work with them for a while. And then if not improving, refer to us. And we would talk to them about surgery, even for a partial tear. Okay, so I just said how important it is to recognize a symptomatic full thickness tear. Okay, but this is interesting. Some patients, especially as they age, will get some asymptomatic full thickness tears. So, uh, so say with this study, this was, this was more incidental full thickness tears found on MRIs. So if you look at people say over 80, 51% of them had a full thickness tear. Um, so I would say you just need to be more worried about uh, a full thickness tear that is associated with pain. So the main goals for our whole medical team would be um, to identify treatments who have rotator cuff disease and of those identify who have rotator cuff tears and refer, especially in cases where there was an acute injury weakness with a full thickness tear, say that's painful. And if you're following somebody with a known partial tear with conservative treatment, if they have an acute change in their clinical course, so all of a sudden they have more pain and weakness, then I would say you wanna refer back to us. We'd wanna examine them. We might get a new MRI because some partial tears um, progress over time, but usually if they progress significantly, they're associated with more weakness and pain, and then those patients might need surgery. Okay, so, um, so what about cortisone shots for say rotator cuff disease or tendonitis instead of frozen shoulder? Uh, well, most studies show at least a small benefit over placebo for at least four weeks, okay? But it is a little difficult to pull the data because sometimes it's hard to know how these patients were diagnosed. Did they have an MRI or not? Uh, what was the steroid used? Was ultrasound used? What was ultrasound used? And some of these were not randomized controlled trials, but I would just say for me, for um, cortisone injections, especially without a full rotator cuff tear, um, I do find them effective. And sometimes for just tendonitis, bursitis impingement, people will get permanent relief with a one-time cortisone in association with physical therapy to help correct some of their mechanics. So what are the risks of doing cortisone shots though in people with rotator cuff disease? And some of, some of this data is new. So we used to say, oh, you know, just come back twice a year for five years if, if you're doing okay. Um, but there is some newer data to suggest that patients with greater than or equal to four steroid injections had worse, worse outcomes after surgery for large to massive rotator cuff tears. And patients with two or more subacromial injections in the year prior to surgery for rotator cuff repair were more likely to have a revision surgery, okay? So to either not heal or re-tear. And um, this is also new data too from 2019. There's also a slightly higher infection rate with rotator cuff repair surgery in patients who had a shoulder cortisone injection within one month of surgery. So what I usually do in my practice, I limit to two per year and not within one month of shoulder surgery, but it is something I still do use in my, in my practice. Okay, so case, case number two, this is a 57 year old right-hand dominant male 
presents with right shoulder pain that started after he slipped and fell three months ago. He has pain in the lateral shoulder, deep to the deltoid. He tried physical therapy without benefit. He's waking up at night from sleep due to pain. On exam, his shoulder is non-tender. His shoulder active range of motion is intact, but with pain with abduction between 60 and 120 degrees. So somewhat of a, I'd say pain, painful arc. And he only has four out of five strength on rotator cuff testing. And his shoulder x-rays are normal. Okay, so how would you treat this patient? Um, provide a sling. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't provide a sling. Recommend a steroid injection. I don't think I'd recommend a, a, steroid, a steroid injection because he hasn't really tried conservative treatment yet and he has a lot of weakness, so I don't want to mask anything worrisome. And then uh, recommend physical therapy. That is something I would think about. But then obtaining a shoulder MRI, that is what I would do in this case, which I'll explain why and uh, potentially then also referring to a surgeon for consideration of arthroscopy. So I'd say in this case, I would get a shoulder MRI first before referring to therapy or doing an injection. And here's some reasons why. So that he's only 57, which is very young. <laughs> and he did have a traumatic mechanism for the shoulder pain and lateral shoulder pain. So I'm thinking maybe rotator cuff, supraspinatus, and he's actually already tried physical therapy and it didn't help. He has a positive painful arc and he has four to five strength with rotator cuff testing. So I'm actually concerned that he has a full thickness, acutely traumatic rotator cuff tear that's already failed physical therapy. So I'd wanna get an, X or, uh, an MRI for him first. Okay, and then we'll, um, actually, does anybody have um, questions about say impingement, rotator cuff tearing before I talk a little bit about injections? Me again. Sure. <laughs> I do. Uh, can you, just because I get this question a lot um, when I'm, I just teach a little bit of a rehab course on the part of the shoulder, we're talking, we talk about rotator cuff, we talk about full thickness requiring surgery really and partial thickness tears, sometimes recovering um, just fine with conservative treatment, things that we can do in as a PT or as a Pilates instructor. But the mechanism of how um, I, it's harder for me to explain what is actually happening at the tendon level that allows a partial thickness tear to heal. So I just wanted to see what you had to say or how you would explain what's actually happening a little more structurally, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, so I, I would actually say, I, I don't necessarily think that partial thickness tears heal, um, but, but I would say low, low grade partial thickness tears. So say if on the MRI, they look like they're maybe 50% thickness or less. Okay. So not a, so, so usually high grade partial tear, we think of it's like hanging on by a thread, you know, maybe there's 10% of the rope still attaching the tendon to bone, but a low grade partial thickness tear would be maybe zero or five to, to 50% thickness. Um, I would just say that, that those just sometimes don't progress, but the problem is it's really hard to know with who is it going to progress on and, and, you know, or which, in which patient it's going to progress and in, in, in which patient it won't. So I, I actually don't think that the partial tears heal very well. I mean, when we look at them arthroscopically, it, the tenon is just white, even with PRP, there's just not good data for it. Um, there's just not good, not good healing potential. Um, but if you can correct their mechanics and the tenon is still attached strongly enough to bone and the inflammation from say when the partial tear occurred calms down, then I would actually say some people can do well for years or maybe forever with a, a, a low grade partial tear. But then other times, I think the patient is just so active that the partial tear just continues to progress. It's sort of like a run in a pantyhose. It's just kind of random. You know, sometimes it can sit like that for, for months and other times the run will just suddenly progress. But usually if it progresses rapidly, the patient's symptoms change, as I said. Um, but I would, yeah, but I was, it's a great question, but I would actually say that we don't really think the tendon heals, but everything else around it compensates, the tendon's still attached. And if the, if the inflammation calms down and the patient's in the lucky group where it doesn't progress, then they, they might get away with their symptoms improving and without surgery and without a new MRI later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where's the tears? Yeah, those, those, first of all, they don't heal. 
but then those can retract more and the muscle, the muscle belly can actually atrophy and get fatty infiltration. And we think that a lot of that is not reversible. So that's why with full thickness tears, we don't want to wait years to fix them because if we fix them years later, the muscle just will never fire properly and the results are not as good. And the other thing is the healing rates for large rotator cuff tears are not as good as small. So if somebody has a full thickness tear, we want to repair that early while it's still small. Yeah, go, go ahead. Was there somebody else or is it me again? <laughs> All right, well, my other question has to do with, um, I, I get this question all the time. Oh, but I thought cortisone injection degrades the tendon. I don't want to have a cortisone injection and degrade a tendon that's already degraded. Um, I, I'm going to let you answer, but I think there's a juggle right. between pain and function and ability to strengthen that you're probably considering all those things when you're talking about an injection. Right. Yeah. So, so I would say if the patient, um, so, so often we will get an MRI first prior to doing an injection. And, and as you said, because cortisone just sort of gets a bad rap and people are afraid of it and, and hear, you know, stories about what it does to cartilage and, and, and tendon, um, that I will often now get an MRI first, just to make sure that they don't have a full tear or a high grade partial tear. Okay. Cause if they have a, you know, if say they're one tenon is torn through more like 90%, then I don't want to mass pain with them. And, you know, their tenon's already so unhealthy. I think doing cortisone is probably not a good idea, but if we get the MRI back and, and say it, it just has a lot of bursitis inflammation, but the tendon itself looks totally intact, or they have a really low grade partial tear, like 10 or 20%, then those are people where I really do think one or maybe two injections is fine. And I talked to them about it. And if they don't want it, that's okay too. But I really do say, you know, the, the studies show if we do one or two injections, that really should not weaken the tissue or, or tendon, or even then if you need rotator cuff surgery later, it should not affect the outcomes at all. So those studies that I showed were, you know, one was four, four plus injections and the other one was, was two plus. So I really do though, for my younger active patients, and I mean, even like, you know, 60 or younger, I, I really limit them to two total. I used to do, you know, five over five years and think it was fine. Um, but, but I would, I would argue now my partners and I would say one or two max, but we really do think that it's safe and it might save them a surgery, right? Because sometimes they're in so much pain that you guys try to rehab them and they just can barely participate. So it, it can be a long-term cure. It, it really can in conjunction with therapy, unlike say severe knee arthritis, the cortisone shot, I guarantee won't last for very long. Um, so yeah. And again, the analogy I use is just throwing a bucket of water on the fire and sometimes we get lucky and all that inflammation just gets put out. And it, sometimes it never comes back. Like I have patients where I saw them 10 years ago for that. I did an injection, they did therapy. And then they come in 10 years later for knee pain. And I say, Oh, how, how is your shoulder? Oh, you know what? It all went away. It never came back. So sometimes if I spin it like that, that it's, this could actually give you permanent relief, then they're more eager to get cortisone, but I would never pressure somebody. <laughs> and if they're just anxious because of the reputation and they don't want it, I would say that, that that's fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I have one more question. I'm going to put the two things together if I might. Uh -huh. So one of our client case studies, actually a current client that we have uh, had a rotator cuff surgery repairs, super successful. Three weeks later, um, starts to develop of adhesive capsulitis on top of the surgery. Um, she's actually one of the few that I've actually seen. I know that that can happen, but I, it's actually one of the few that I've seen. It got so bad that they had to go in and do a manipulation under anesthetic after also. So ended up being a much, much, much longer rehab for her. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious how common things like that are. And if we know more about why I've always been, what I've found is that it's mostly insidious. We don't really absolutely know why we get the adhesive capsulitis, but that it does tend to happen sometimes after a trauma or after surgery more commonly to just see if that, is that what you see or do we know more about 
why and how that might be going on? Sure. Yeah. So it, it, it is random. Some of it, I would say, you know, I do the exact same rotator cuff repair surgeries every week. And sometimes people get their motion back right on track pretty easily. And other times it takes longer or once in a while they do get this refractory frozen shoulder, say after the surgery um, to where they might even need yeah manipulation or a arthroscopic arthroscopic release. Um, usually if, if it's a severe case like that, though, that, that required that, that treatment, um, she might have risk factors. I mean, she might've been between, you know, 40 and 60, even, even just that, I would say that, that they tend to get some more post-op frozen shoulder than, than say other, other people. I mean, I don't know if she had diabetes on top of it or, or thyroid issues or autoimmune disease or any other in, inflammatory risk factors. Um, yeah. So, but, but I would say, um, what, what we are doing is moving people faster a little faster. So even post-op day one, at least the, the protocol that my partners and I have, um, we do start patients with, you know, passive forward elevation just to 90 degrees, even post-op day one. Um, so I, I think, I think, you know, especially if you think the person might be at risk and say they don't have really large tears um, that, that you fix, so they were say smaller rotator cuff tears that you fixed, you could potentially move that patient earlier and maybe that would prevent some frozen shoulder. The other thing we're finding is the PT places now are booked so far out. We, I've been now telling my patients to book physical therapy right when I book the surgery. Because if you see them back for at the time of surgery or their, for their first post-op visit two weeks later, often they can't get into therapy on time. So I don't know if that was also an issue you know, may, maybe with this patient or not, but, um, but yeah, I would just say that to try to prevent that to, I mean, depending on the surgeon to move them even a little bit of just passive motion, starting even post-op day one is probably okay based on the studies. And then just making sure that, you know, that patients book physical therapy far ahead of time and just stay ahead of their pain too. That's the thing. I wonder if she had more pain than average um, sometimes you have to bump up the pain medication or remind them to take an anti-inflammatory with, you know, with, with say the, the Norco or Percocet. And then once in a while too, if, if I see somebody freezing like that after rotator cuff surgery, um, we can have them get just a one-time glenohumeral intraarticular cortisone injection if they're open to that, especially by three months, the rotator cuff's usually pretty healed, like pretty darn sticky. So I would actually argue at three months on, it would be safe to do a cortisone in the joint. And maybe that would give her enough of a head start with therapy to where you wouldn't have had to do that, that procedure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't often get to see them right post-op because I don't take insurance. So I get them when right. they've been through and it hasn't worked and then they come <laughs> And they're like, oh, it's not working. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, so who knows with, with her, I mean, maybe she just had a lot of post-op pain. Maybe she started therapy a little late. Maybe that surgeon is just more conservative with his or her protocol in terms of start, I mean, locking somebody in a sling with no motion until six weeks. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think, yeah, we still have a little time. Um, and again, I can stay as long as, as everybody needs. So um, I'll just cover a little bit on, on some other injections because yeah, we're just getting lots of questions about these now. Um, so platelet-rich plasma or PRP, uh, the definition of that is a volume of plasma with platelet count greater than that of whole blood. And there are growth factors that are present in and around the platelets. And the concentration of these growth factors can be a, a powerful biological treatment. So we think that they might help with stem cell pr proliferation, modulating pain, also potentially acting as an anti-inflammatory, but um, these do not regrow cartilage or tendons, okay? So they're really not very regenerative, uh, unfortunately. So if you have a patient who's getting PRP, how does it work? Well, the patient in clinic will get a peripheral blood draw then the blood goes into a centrifuge where the platelets are separated out. And then um, you have this PRP layer that's ready for injection. Okay, and this has been frustrating when trying to talk to patients about PRP or look at the PRP data in the literature because not all PRP is the same. 
So how I describe this to patients is it's, it's really, um, really comparing apples to oranges. So there are all these different centrifuges that prepare the PRP in slightly different formulas. So uh, some of them have more leukocytes or white blood cells, some have more or less fibrin. So it's, it's really like comparing apples to oranges. Now, stem cell treatment, we're getting a lot more questions about those. So what is say a stem cell or stem cell treatment? Well, mesenchymal stem cells are types of cells that have potential to differentiate into cartilage, bone, tendon, and muscle. And they may lead to regeneration of tissue, or at least that's the hope at some point. And they are present in the bone marrow and the fat. Okay, and limitations of these studies, as I touched on with uh, PRP, is that a lot of these studies with PRP and stem cells have no control group, um, inconsistent reporting of exact formulation of biologic treatment, and inconsistent injection protocols. Okay, so uh, around the tendon, in the tendon, uh, with ultrasound, without ultrasound. And word of caution for stem cells. So UCSF, we're actually still not offering stem cells yet because we feel like they don't work that well yet. There's not strong enough data and there are actually some potential safety issues. So this was a New York Times article um, from 2018 about Genentech. So these were Genentech stem cells. There were 12 people hospitalized with infections from stem cell shots ranging from the spine to the knee. And these patients were all hospitalized anywhere from four to 58 days. And then they tested some of the other unused vials of the stem cells from Genentech and they tested positive for E. coli and other fecal bacteria. So we're definitely a little hesitant with, with stem cells. I, I hope in the future we're, we're more aggressive with with recommending them and, and say UCSF's able to offer them, but not yet. So with stem cells, they're not drugs, so they might not need FDA approval. They're not regulated. There aren't registries, although this is in the works. And a lot of these clinics, uh, stem cell only clinics rely on say patient testimonials instead of true data for, uh, for offering their treatments. So this is another sort of scary article from one of our um, most famous orthopedic journals, JBJS, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery from January 2020. But it was entitled Online Direct to Consumer Advertising of Stem Cell Therapy for Musculoskeletal Injury and Disease, Misinformation and Violation of Ethical and Legal Advertising Parameters. So uh, this study looked at 896 practice websites for stem cells that, um, that were included. And about 96% contained at least one statement of misinformation with a mean of <laughs> four to five statements of misinformation among the sites. So then you think, well, what if it's associated say with an orthopedic surgeon or a podiatrist? Well, those clinics only had 22% fewer statements of misinformation. So just word of caution, you know, the patients Google and find all these websites with testimonials. But again, we, we just don't recommend stem cells yet overall with UCSF. But we do offer and recommend PRP for certain conditions. And a lot of my patients um, do these injections with ultrasound, which is great. So how does, or how, how, do, how do I discuss PRP treatments with my patients? How does it work? Well, it's likely pain relief through um, anti-inflammatory mediators. There, no, there's no evidence though that these injections are disease modifying. So there's actually not good evidence that say a partial rotator cuff tear can heal with PRP or that say it will form new cartilage in a knee arthritis patient. Um, and we just do what's done in the studies, okay? So uh, for mild to moderate, say knee arthritis, not bone on bone, sometimes we would order PRP for a patient. Uh, if it's um, PRP in a joint with cartilage, okay? We'd wanna use leukocyte for PRP. So PRP without a lot of right, white blood cells because we don't wanna create inflammation in the joint. But if we're ordering PRP for tendinosis tendinitis, like say tennis elbow um, or potential in the shoulder, then we'd wanna uh, use leukocyte rich PRP. And how I remember that is you, you actually in a way wanna create inflammation to help heal the tendon, okay? And then probably use ultrasound guidance. And the cost, I'll tell you, UCSF charges $1,000, um, but unfortunately insurance still usually does not cover the cost of PRP, definitely not stem cells. Um, but UCSF sometimes has some trials going on. So um, sometimes they can work with patients on cost, but sometimes there are also studies that they might be able to participate in. For example, with mild knee arthritis, um, there's been one going on right now. 
So take home points about PRP and stem cells. Uh, so they hold promise as potential treatment options for various musculoskeletal conditions. Not all formulations or injection protocols are the same. Many of the studies that have been done to study them so far are small with no control group, and they're not covered by insurance, and high-level controlled trials are needed before widespread recommendation, uh, or before we, I would say, recommend these treatments in a widespread basis, especially with stem cells. And with stem cells, just beware of false advertising and some safety issues, and that's what I had prepared today, but I'm happy to take questions. And then, um, yeah, you, you are all welcome to email me anytime with my email. Uh, and then if you ever yeah. wanted to refer patients, this would be the new, um, the new patient appointment line. And then I also have a, a long time, wonderful practice assistant who helps run my practice. We've been together the whole 14 years since I've been in practice, she came with me to UCSF. Mm -hmm. Her name is Sarah. And then also my cell phone, anytime um, any of you can just message me if you just have a, have a question. And thank you for your time today too and your, and your good questions. Any other questions or even anything near shoulder related also, I could, I could try to help. <laughs> what about swollen tendon um, on the bicep attachment? Oh, sure. So, so do you mean um, like swelling around the long head of biceps on the MRI yeah. that, that's mm -hmm. often read? Yeah. Or like long head of biceps, halo of fluid or edema, tendinosis edema. How, how do you heal that? Um, sure. So, yeah. So, so first of all, I would try to correlate it with, with the patient's symptoms. Okay. Because um, kind of like, you know, those full thickness rotator cuff tears or partial rotator cuff tears, right? There can be sometimes pathology in the shoulder that's read as positive on an MRI or even AC arthritis on an MRI and it's not causing symptoms, but say you have a patient where they do have symptoms of biceps tendonitis. So that would usually be, you know, tenderness anteriorly, maybe on exam, um, some pain with resistive biceps flexion, a positive uh, speeds, maybe a positive Jorgensen's, you know, so they have pain with say resisted uh, supination over the, over the anterior mm -hmm. shoulder. And then they had an MRI that showed biceps, tendonitis, tendinosis, fluid around it. Um, so first of all, I, I usually would start conservative with those patients, just like rotator cuff tendonitis. So it's biceps tendonitis, it's like rotator cuff tendonitis. Um, but of course, if you're working with them, they've probably already tried conservative, meaning therapy and anti-inflammatories. So, um, so then if it's still symptomatic, uh, I would actually have one of my partners do a ultrasound guided bicep sheath injection. Um, you don't wanna inject into the tendon itself. It could weaken the tendon, but it's very safe for um, under ultrasound. Usually there's a little halo of fluid around the tendon for say somebody to go in with ultrasound and inject cortisone there. It just bathes that portion of the tendon with anti-inflammatory. And I've had some really good results with that. So I'd say that would probably be the next step but then if the patient still does not improve and their symptoms really correlate with biceps pain, then we, then there are surgeries we can do to address that, which would either be a biceps tenotomy where we just release the, the long head of the biceps off the labrum. And that, um, you know, takes all the tension off of it, takes the rubbing out of the groove, but the short head is still attached. They usually have little to no strength loss, believe it or not with that. Or, um, we also could do a tenodesis where we, um, we detach the long head of the biceps off the labrum, but then we reattach the biceps either in the groove or below, um, under the, under the pec major tendon. So, um, so either biceps tenotomy or tenodesis would be a surgical option to treat that pain if it's refractory. What about dry needling? Is it ever like, does that help? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that also. Yes. I think there are very few people in in the Bay area or in California compared to other States that, that offer that actually Zaina recently, I, I, I messaged Kristen to try to find good acupuncturists that she recommended. And she messaged me back with a couple. And there was actually somebody who does dry needling, um, okay. in San Francisco. I, I could give you the name, but yes, well, I I'm on the East coast. Help. I'm on the East coast. And, um, I actually had that diagnosis and I went for physical therapy and I told them I wanted dry needling. Mm -hmm. And I had four sessions. And I never got any dry needling. The guy, and I asked, are you certified dry needling? And he was, why do you think he would wait that long? If he, you think like, 
he didn't do anything. I mean, I, I don't know. Changed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it would be totally safe to try dry needling. I mean, if it is, well, it's good to know it's what, what you had, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but, but if it is the biceps tendonitis halo of fluid, I mean, that is an inflammatory thing. So it would also make mm -hmm. sense that yeah, dry needling, maybe even acupuncture, right. Oral anti-inflammatories, anything mm -hmm. to help with inflammation right. would help. Okay. But, but if that doesn't help, then we do want a targeted anti-inflammatory there because I would never mm -hmm. just go straight to surgery for biceps tendonitis. Right. So I would mm -hmm. definitely try ultrasound guided injection first. And again, needs to be ultrasound guided because you don't want somebody to, to put cortisone in your bicep tendon. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. I wanted to just throw another question out there. Um, mostly just because I want to hear your take. We get all the time people coming in, especially I would say in the Pilates realm, more than the physical th therapy realm. Um, that they say, oh yeah, I have pain in my deltoid. It's my deltoid. My massage therapist said it was my deltoid. Um, <laughs> and so what I, and I always get this question when I'm going through that same rehab course, people are like, well, can't that be the deltoid? I'm like, yeah, no, the deltoid is short and fat and super strong. Like it's not usually the deltoid. So they, I, I have never seen somebody with an actual deltoid problem that I've had to work on. I don't know if you have or in what situations that that would even be a worry or who, who is that person that we're looking for that might actually have a deltoid dysfunction? Sure. I would say, yeah, a, a true deltoid problem is very, very, very rare. I, I get the exact same thing. Yeah. It's my deltoid. It can't be my rotator cuff. And yeah, it, yeah. I, I always do just explain that that rotator cuff does typically present as, you know, lateral deltoid Definitely. pain, especially if it's su the supraspinatus being involved. So yeah, I'd say 99, literally 99, not even 95, 99% of the time it is the rotator cuff. It's <laughs> really cuff. never the deltoid, but, um, I know you examine people with say their shirt off, but I do think, especially if they're really fixated on the deltoid, that it would be good to check that because you know, what, once in a while, you know, somebody could have say an axillary nerve issue, um, where mm -hmm. that affects teres minor and deltoid. Okay. So it could be some zebra instead of a horse, or it could be they, God forbid, have like a tumor in the deltoid or, or something like that. Um, right. I mean, once in a great while, I'll actually have somebody that comes in for routine knee stiffness or, or pain or shoulder stiffness or pain. And, and we get imaging and they actually have mm -hmm. some type of tumor. So I would say if they're super anxious about it or fixated on it, um, you could always just have them see one of us and then we could get a little imaging just to confirm it is rotator cuff. And if I verbally tell them it's probably rotator cuff, that would be fine. But I would say you are safe to say that probably 99% of the time it is not the deltoid and it's rotator cuff. Thank you. I just needed to hear you say that. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> How can it's deltoid? It can't be deltoid. But yeah, we get a lot because people are doing a lot of self diagnosis. A lot of times they're working out in the gym. Oh, my trainer said that's the deltoid, or I, you know, I heard that that could be my deltoid. So yeah, I was like, eh, it's kind of short and fat and really strong. It's not typically that. Um, so, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> I get the same thing. Too. It's like, oh, I know it's not your deltoid. <laughs> And also the deltoid would show up on the same MRI. <laughs> it would, yeah, for sure. Um, do you guys have any other questions for Dr. LaRose? No, I, okay, I'm gonna ask another one then. I told you I could, I could take up your whole time. Sure, no, no, no. <laughs> that's a question. Um, so I just, do you have a minute to just touch a little bit on shoulder subluxation? Mm -hmm. uh, so this, these are my younger clients. Um, I would say that more commonly shoulder subluxation due to sport or cra crashes during sport is usually what, where that's happening. Um, and then I get into the healing healing zone. So say, I would say these are my under twenties, mostly time yeah. to healing um, and then definitely working on stability. But um, how, I guess you never know if it's going to sub, if it's the first subluxation, you never know if it's going to get stable enough to not sublux again. But in mm -hmm. what, is there um, some idea that we could have that, that, that we're actually making good enough progress before we send them out to do sport again? I'm always a little nervous about, you know, after first subluxation, 
I know it's at six to eight weeks, working hard, getting strong, checking them out in clinic, but then throwing them back out to go skiing or play yeah. basketball or, you know, is always, I always feel like, I hope this works out as I'm, as I'm planning, yeah. it does, you know? So I don't know if there's any other indicators or if you have any advice on how to really know they're stable enough for like physical sport. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and just so you know, too, I, I actually do give some talks to the residents even on shoulder instability. It's always one of our core rotating topics. So in the future, in the next year or two, I'm also happy yeah. to give like a full talk on just shoulder instability. Any, anything from, okay, awesome. you know, laxity, Ehlers-Donlos, <laughs> all the way up yeah, to yeah, subluxations yeah. to, to, to full dislocations in all different age groups. So I, I definitely could go into that in more detail too. But yeah, I would just say the overview um, is, I, I would say there is a difference between subluxation and dislocation, okay? Um, and, and I know for, for these purposes right now, we're, we're not talking about Ehlers-Donlos or, or just generalized laxity. We're talking about, say, you know, the patient was always fine and they had some type of acute um, traumatic event or sports injury, right, where they subluxed or dislocated. Um, so one thing is like 95% of the time, the, the shoulder comes out the front, okay, or front bottom, right, anterior inferior. So, so ju just to know that, um, but it is good to maybe get, you know, the imaging reports just to double check that because once in a while, say in a football lineman, they'll get, you know, they'll have an axial load posteriorly, right? And they can actually have a posterior labrum tear or posterior instability. So, um, but, but assuming you have a good diagnosis, I'd say if it's, if it was probably just a subluxation, there's a, a much better chance that the person will get back earlier, like maybe say six weeks instead of three months. And, and maybe they'll get away with never having to have surgery and never having another event. Okay. I just think the success of say, um, rotator cuff strengthening scapular stabilization for a subluxation is much better than a dislocation. If somebody had a true one-time dislocation, um, where it's, it's known, right? Like they, they say went to an ER and had to get it um, put back in, mm -hmm. then unfortunately people say about 18 or under 20, there's, especially in contact athletes, there's an 80 plus percent chance that they will come out again, no matter what. It's very frustrating, even with months and months of the best physical therapy. So when I first started practice, we, we hardly ever would offer surgery to somebody who fully dislocated once. Okay. Cause you, and you're dealing with parents and coaches. It's, it's kind of traumatic for them mentally. But, but now um, we actually, I mean, we, we looked at the statistics and it's just for contact athletes or even just high risk athletes, like skateboarders, things like that. Yeah. It's like an 80 plus percent chance that, that they might come out again. So we talked to them about it. And with some of those patients, I mean, no matter what we try therapy for a little while, but we just don't want the patient or you to think, oh, great, this is for sure going to work. You know, so sometimes we actually do offer surgery for a first time dislocator especially if the timing's good, like it's, it's off season, because if they still want to go back and play football or basketball for four more years in college, they're, they're actually probably not going to be able to do it if we don't do surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if it's say they, they only subluxed or they dislocated and maybe they're 25, not as high risk, and they really don't want surgery, that's great. That's fine. Then I would have them do rehab only. Um, and and, and yes, really working on rotator cuff strengthening. And I explained to patients how that works with the, I say the rotator cuff is like the secondary stabilizer, right? The dynamic mm -hmm. concavity compression. So the bigger and beefier the rotator cuff muscles are around the shoulder, the more the ball is going to sit well and strong okay. on the, on the socket. So I do tell them that. So they'll be hopefully compliant. Um, but I, I would say they'd probably need to go, you know, even maybe twice a week for six weeks and then maybe once a week for six more weeks. I mean, I think they really do need a lot of, of PT. And then in terms of when they're ready, like, like your question about when are they ready? I would just say their rotator cuff needs to test really strong in all planes. And um, they need to just not feel apprehensive anymore. I mean, they have to be able to mentally mm -hmm. trust it. So if you, you know, just bring them into the apprehension mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. if there's like, oh man, I really feel like it's going to come out then Unfortunately, I think they might need to see us that no matter what you did with strengthening, the they maybe have a labrum tear or the capsule anteriorly so loose that they're in that 80% where it's just going to come out again. Because if mentally they can't trust it to go back to sport, 
it, it's probably going to come out again or, or they'll injure something else. So I would actually say that mm -hmm. this is a, it is a rough problem and more and more patients who are young, who dislocate need surgery compared to, to what we thought based on previous literature. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know there's not an easy answer to that one. Um, and, and honestly, I do deal with quite a few with Ehlers Danlos also. Mm -hmm. um, one of which we discovered Ehlers Danlos because of a shoulder subluxation issue. Wow. Um, yeah. So it was, um, anyway, that week, I would love to jump in um, to hear you talk about that sometime too, <laughs> when you're doing that or have you come on and we'll do a whole nother thing. Yeah, 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 no, no problem. Yeah, and those are really yeah. hard patients, right? And I and know. we try not to operate on them ever, just because no, I know. Is good. Yeah. yeah, they just don't have normal yeah. tissues. So, yeah, those, no. those patients and the scarring and that, right? like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. thanks everybody for attending. And um, Zaina, let me know next time you're in the Bay Area. <laughs> Let's try. Yes, I will. <laughs>